What's up everyone, Lance Hedrick here. And today we're gonna take a look at the Eureka Oro Single Dose. So today's video is brought to you in part by Seattle Coffee Gear. They have loaned me this DF64 that was shipped direct to me from Italy. And I wanna thank you Seattle Coffee Gear so much for allowing me to make a review of this. Um, you know, I'm sure it's always nerve wracking for people to send out equipment to be reviewed, especially from people like me who uh, is gonna be blunt about the review. So um, I, I thank you Seattle Coffee Gear once more. Make sure you check them out. Um, they've been so great. They lent me the Specialita and they also lent me another thing I'll be making a video on soon enough. Uh, but thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's people like you that allow me to do more of these videos. Um, and for those of you who want me to be able to do other things, uh, please check out my Patreon below. That's how I'm able to get the funds to buy things to do videos on. So thank you Seattle Coffee Gear, thank you my Patreon, and thank you for all the viewers who are about to watch at least some of this. Um, thanks, and let's continue now. So the Eureka Mignon series, which this is a part of, is an incredibly well-built, well-known series of grinders. Well, I just did a video on the Specialita uh, right here and in comparison with two other comparably sized and priced grinders. Um, and there are a lot of others in that lineup as well. They've, had a, uh, they've built a reputation over many, many years as being a really high quality grinder company based out of Italy. So you've probably heard about them. Uh, you, you, may have, you may have one, you may have tried one, you may not have heard of them. Anyway, this is going to be a look at their newest release, the single dose. I'm a little late to the game, but uh, I did it as soon as I could get my hands on one in the US. So this is their attempt at making a single dosing option. All of them have been grind by feed, so uh, kind of hopper style grinders. This one they actually created in order to minimize retention and to increase efficiency when single dosing in the home use. So to begin, of course, I wanna hit, this This has a 320 watt motor, which is an incredibly robust robust motor for the price point of about 799 US dollars. Um, that, and just always like to give comparisons, the DF64, which runs around 500 or so dollars, has a 250 watt motor. So this is 90 watt, it has a 90 watts more drawing ca capability. Um, the fellow Ode uh, has a 140 watt motor. The uh, Barata Forte has a 130 watt motor. So that's kind of the idea here. This thing has a very robust motor. All of their machines do. Uh, it, it, you're not gonna have an issue there. It is an AC motor. Um, I tend to have preferred you know, brushless DCs, things like that. But this is an AC motor, but you do have a really high power. So we have, uh, we have that. Then it spins at an RPM of 1620, 1620. So that is uh, comparable. That's in between a Vario and a Forte. The Vario spins at about 1350, the Forte at around 1900. So you're sitting kind of in between those two. So it's a little higher than I would typically like, but in reality, it's not it's not that much difference. Uh, I really enjoy, I do like 1400, but I like the ability to get maybe a little lower. The Malkunig X54, for instance, rotates at 1050 RPM. Anyway, so let's go ahead and just take a look at this. And also I'm gonna link in the caption an incredible video by the Wired Gourmet. He deconstructs completely this machine and goes over the components inside. Because that resource is already out there, I'm not gonna pull this thing apart to show you uh, how it's made. Instead, check, check his video out. He does, he's an incredibly thorough YouTuber who does breakdowns of grinders. I really appreciate them. Okay. So let's take a quick look. First off, the first eye-catching thing is a stock grinder that comes with bellows. Now, this is becoming more and more common in the grinding world, but it's really interesting to see such a stable company as Eureka to build one that has a stock bellows. So you have bellows like so. Now, you don't have to use the bellows. It comes with just a normal plastic lid uh, that fits really well. The wooden lid doesn't, that because it's made of wood, they, there's a little bit of tolerance differences from lid to lid. That Mine actually fits really nicely, but you don't have to use the bellows if you don't want. Um, that being said, I did spend a few hours uh, yesterday evening testing retention on this. So I was asked to try and not use the bellows by Eureka because they don't believe it's necessary. Um, and a lot of people have been talking about how the chute has been getting clogged or how there's uh, the bells are uh, not efficient, yada, yada, yada. So I did do some testing on my own. I uh, took the weights of many different samples of coffee at different grind sizes. I did around 1,000 to 1,050 uh, microns and 500 to 550 microns. I did multiple samples of each. And I, I measured the grind sizes with the Kruv Bruler. And I'm looking around for it because I thought I brought it, but... 
Dang, I did bring it. So I use this to kind of measure because I don't have a, a laser at home, but essentially I got the grounds on a white piece of paper, used a bright LED light, and I tried to find the closest surface, uh, the closest diameter to the diameters shown here. Um, so that's why I gave it a range of about 50 microns. So I did two different measurements and I would dose the coffee dry, because that's the other thing is Eureka does not recommend doing RDT, which if you're unfamiliar, RDT is spritzing the, the coffee with a little bit of water to uh, arguably re reduce static. That's still yet to be proven, uh, though I think there may be something come out soon. Uh, wink, wink. Um, and, and, but mostly it's, it's been used to reduce the chaff that comes out. They say you don't need that, so I did all my testing without RDT. So uh, yeah, so there's no water weight to take into account when I'm looking at retention. So at 1,000 to 1050 microns, the retention was minimal. It was very impressive actually. When going that course, it did an incredible job. So I would put in around 15, 15.1 15 grams. I would get out around four tenths of a gram less, maybe five tenths of a gram less on average. Okay, and that way it was pretty consistent. Um, and then when I went down to, or when I would go and back and do bellows, I would get another three or four tenths gram out. So after doing bellows, and let me, let me, uh, let me say, let me make sure I do say this. When doing the bellows, doing soft taps does not suffice. Doing this is not good enough. Um, especially the finer you go, you need to kind of give it pops like that. And maybe some came out right now, but um, you need to do pops like this and the, the hatch must be closed. If it's not closed, it's gonna lose a lot of air out the side. I can feel it right here. This needs to be closed. It's very precisely cut so that it does not allow that leakage of air. Okay, so you gotta hit it really hard, not gonna lie. And you'll get the last like three or four tenths out. So once I was doing that, I was getting less than a tenth of a gram of retention. Just to like read off some numbers, I did a 15.1 gram dose post grind initial was 14.53, and then post bellows I had 14.73. This was the worst one, this was an outlier. Uh, but then the next ones I had were 15.14 in, I got 14.7 grams out, um, and then after bellows I got 15, so 0.14 off. Next one was 15.16, I got 14.73 without bellows, 15.08 with bellows, so 0.08 less. Uh, then 15.11, I got 14.71 without bellows, and then 15.09, with bellows, which is 0.02 off, which is pretty impressive. Um, obviously, this is not, um, and there are more numbers there, but didn't want to bore you. This is not an exact science on how I'm doing it, obviously, because, for instance, we know based off of uh, Dr. Samo Smirke's research that 0.1 of the weight of, of coffee is released as gas during the grinding process, so zero retention is impossible. And in fact, on a 15 gram dose, that means 0.15 should be gone based off of that. Uh, but as we noticed, that last one had 0.02 grams that didn't come out. So that means when I'm doing bellows, there are some grounds that have been caught somewhere inside that are escaping in successive grounds. But, you know, it is what it is. I'm putting in 15, I'm getting out roughly 15. That is good for me. That means you're gonna be wasting less coffee. Good to go. All right, so I did really enjoy that. Now if you, uh, there, and honestly, there wasn't a ton of static buildup, but RDT would improve the static issue or the, well, I guess I, guess I should say the, the um, uh, chaff issue. So there is, you know, whenever I'm doing bellows and stuff, there are fines that kind of fly everywhere with a little bit of water on the beans that does help it. But again, they do not recommend doing RDT. I'm not sure why. Um, I asked and didn't really get uh, uh, an answer, but you know, I'm not gonna push, I'm not gonna push that. So I'm not going to recommend doing that, um, especially because the numbers were so good. Now in, in comparison to like the DF64, that one you must RD or you're gonna have static everywhere. You're gonna have chaff everywhere all over your grinder. And this is something I also tested in a future video on the DF DF64. But for this one, the retention was incredibly minimal, super impressive, and that is what they were pushing so hard for. So some of the differences with this grinder with other Mignons is it's at this tilt, which is very similar to the P64, the DF64, and others. This is a tilt that a lot of people at 15 degrees, people have found helps to reduce the retention. Now, I'm not, I'm not sold that that's, that that's doing too much, um, but you know, I haven't done as much R&D as the team has there, and they came out very specifically with 15 degrees. So you know, I, you know, who, who knows? Um, something that the Wired Gourmet pointed out in that video I, I posted below is uh, this does have incredibly loud. It, this is an incredibly loud grinder, grinder. Um, and I'll show you that here in a second with that app on my phone. But one of his speculations is that the motor housing on the bottom or the motor on the bottom is not stabilized well because of how it's tilted. And so he was playing around with padding the sides in order to lessen the decibels. Um, 
But anyway, uh, again, you should check that video out to see exactly how he broke that down. But I'm going to go ahead, we're going to grind some coffee, and I'm going to show you what the noise level is. All right, so I'm going to dump some beans in there, put the lid back on. Now I'm going to turn it on. Before I release the hopper, I'm going to turn it on, and we're going to look at the decibels. And here we go. So around 71, 72 is without beans going through it. And then here we go on the actual grinding in three, two, one. So it got around 89 to 90. Um, so that's, that's the highest I've actually tested. That was a little higher than the Brazza Sete um, when it was grinding. So that's... Uh, that's kind of the noise issue there. There's a lot of vibrations going on. There's, it's, just, it's just a noisy grinder. And then as we can see, since I just put some coffee in, and this is quite coarse, I'm probably at eight or 900 microns right now. You can see how much is about to come out when I do my first billow. See all that? Then you gotta kind of pump it. You see how some, a ton more came out when I hit it hard? So the exit chute can get clogged with coffees, and so sometimes you need a really forceful amount of air to unclog it. Over time, if you're not paying attention, it can clump up, especially if you're using this for espresso. Now, another test that I did run, and this is also not incredibly scientific, so I was just, I don't have a laser particle analysis machine. So um, what I did is I ground at that 1,000 uh, micron size, the 500 micron size, and I took the fellow shimmy, which has a sieve inside of 200 microns. So that means anything with a diameter of 200 microns can squeeze through. Uh, now, fines, that's a debatable topic as far as what, constitute a, what constitutes a fine. Obviously, espresso is brewed at 200, so is espresso all fines? Or are we talking about sub-100 microns, sub-50 microns, sub-8? It's debatable, but what I did is for pour overs, you know, we're, we're sitting at the finest we'd be at maybe 500 microns, up to 1,000 and even up to 1,600 if you're doing really coarse grounds. So I took 1,000 microns, 500 microns, and I did the shimmy to see how much sub 200 micron particles there are. Now let me give some caveats because these are not, uh, this is not dogmatic. This is not clear cut black and white. There's a lot of gray. So essentially, when you have a 200 micron diameter, that means grounds that that has a, could have a diameter of 300 microns could squeeze through if it was you know shaped like a hot dog, right? So maybe the diameter of the long the end of the the short end might be 200, and it could go through long ways like that. So there could be a lot of grounds that went through that were not actually fines, but they were able to squeeze through because they were like hot dog type grounds. On top of that, static plays a massive role in, 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 in grounds in general. So fines are gonna stick to boulders really intensely. And although you can shake and shake and shake and shake, a lot of them just won't come off. So what I did is I set a timer and for every sample I pulled, I shook for a minute really aggressively on the shimmy. My elbows were hurting uh, because I did it for many, many samples, but I wanted to ensure I had a good average. Now the average amount of fines that I pulled out, fine, sub 200, whatever that means, that I pulled out on a 1000 micron grind was around 2.75. That was around the average. It was anywhere from about 2.65 to around 2.9. That's the grams, right? So quite a bit was coming out. Now for reference, when I competed in Brewer's Cup and did my whole removing fines routine, then EK43, that was not aligned because I could not align the stock ones uh, that I used at comp, but with an unaligned EK43, which we know produces quite a bit of fines, I was only getting 2.1 to 2.2 out. So it's quite a bit, and then you get a lot less with other grinders as well. So with pour overs at 1,000, there was quite a bit of small, smaller than you wanted particle sizes. Um, when you go down to 500 microns, um, the amount of sub 200s obviously increases exponentially because we're grinding a lot finer. There's gonna be a lot more of those smaller particles come out. It was around a 6.2 to 6.3 average uh, of sub 200 micron particles in the ones that I shimmied at 500 microns. So that's, that's, that's kind of the case there. Whenever you're going finer and finer with this, you're getting loads and loads more fines. So for pour overs, the stock burrs, um, I found to not be ideal. They were very muddled cups of coffee. Perhaps if you like really dark roasted coffee, they'll do fine. But I've heard that they have a set of brew burrs that might be good for what you're wanting. But I just kind of wanted to point that out. Now the burr geometry, uh, we're gonna look at right now. So uh, I'm gonna pop this off just so you can get a kind of look inside of what it looks like under the hood, because it is important whenever you do want to change your burrs or you want to clean out your grinder, do whatever. So I'm going to flip this around. I do kind of like this. They have a hidden screw behind their little emblem right back here. So you take a little flat head, you just pop it off. Then we have a Phillips head. 
So we're going to take that. Just going to unscrew that. And then uh, after this screw, I'm going to clap and we're going to have the top off ready. And all right, so I've pulled off the top and this is what we have here. This is the top burr carrier. Um, there's only two screws, which to me is not ideal. I wish there were three places for uh, pressure there, but that is what it is. We're going to pull that burr off and we're going to take a look at what these burrs look like. So if you notice, we have about 12 pre-breakers there and it looks suspiciously close to another type of burr, which I'm going to show you here in a second. So on top, I have the DF64 stock burr, and on the bottom, the diamond-coated 65 millimeter Eureka Oro stock burr. So if you notice, they have the same, almost the same exact geometry. If there's a difference, I can't tell with the naked eye other than the coating themselves. And then on top of that, here's another burr with a similar geometry. This one I got from AliExpress. It's from the same people that make those Gevi burrs from the Budget Grinder Showdown that I showed. I'll link that above right now. But as you see, these are all very similar to style burrs. Now in my, obviously I've had a lot of experience with all three of these. And in my experience, this style of burr, especially with that many pre-breakers, is fantastic for producing a lot of fines and making delicious espresso. Um, I have found consistently with these though that they are not ideal for filter coffee. So uh, that is interesting. Now of course, we all know that um, the, the, the Eureka markets this as a 65 millimeter grinder, um, which is interesting because as I showed in my Specialita video, uh, the 55 millimeter burrs are actually a little smaller than the other market uh, 54 millimeter burrs. They were just shy of the Didding Steels, which are 54s. Um, same thing here. These are actually not 65 millimeters. They are 64. In fact, they are around 64.05 millimeters. Um, I forgot my calipers today, but I would show you otherwise. The way I can show you though, is I'm going to take this off. We're going to take off this top burr and I'm going to replace it with some other 64 millimeter burrs. Now the SSPs do not fit and it's because SSP burrs are 64.2 millimeters. Um, the new cast burrs, so Hansung did two runs of them. The first run he did his normal 60, uh, 64.2, but for a second run he did 64.1 and even those still do not fit in this. So not only are these not 65, but they are lower, they are smaller than the SSP 64s, which are not truly 64, I guess. All right, so here's something I wanted to show. Quite a bit of retention underneath. There's a gap underneath the burr, which is not ideal. I wish it maybe came up just a little bit so that all that coffee wouldn't get underneath, but it is what it is. All right, so I'm going to grab a few burrs here. All right, so I pulled out a few burrs. This is the stock fellow Ode burr that had those massive ridges on the side. This is that AliExpress burr with the 12 pre-breakers. This is another AliExpress burr that has the same geometry, has the same geometry as those Gevi burrs that I loved in that video I, I posted earlier. Um, and then on top of that, here are the Gorilla Gear burrs that I featured in my fellow Ode video made by John Gordon of Gorilla Gear. So we have these, these are all 64 millimeter burrs. Now here is the plate for the Eureka. Uh, the Eureka. Now I'm gonna take the Gorilla Gears. Boom, they fit. Okay. AliExpress 12 pre-breaker. They fit. AliExpress uh, less pre-breakers. Uh, I don't know how many this is. Less pre-breakers. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Oh wait, this was 12. Sorry, the other one's a lot more than that. I don't know what I was thinking. I think it's 24. So the, I'm sorry, the Eureka, the DF64, and this one are like 24 maybe. Now I need to count it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, sorry, 20 pre-breaker on the uh, Oro, this AliExpress, and the uh, DF64. And then uh, this one has 12. This is the one that's similar to the Gevi Burr. And then we have the Ode Burr fits in it as well. Now, just to show, here is the SSP multi-purpose Burr. And this does not fit. It's too big. So looking up closely, So it's just a little too big um, at 64.2 mils. But that means that we can fit any of these other burrs in there, including the Gorilla Gear. So if you already have an Oro and you're wanting to switch up your burrs, there are options. Um, any of these really work. And I'll put the links to those AliExpress burrs below. They're actually quite good. I think that they do a great job with their cuts. Um, and here, you can take a look at this again. This is the one that emulates the Gevi burr. So it's got really nice deep cuts and it actually does a pretty solid job for filter and does a good job for espresso. If you're more into the darker roast, you can do the 20 pre-breaker one. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and put back the burr set. 
but I just wanted to show you that the, the Gorilla Gears do fit. So if you wanted to increase the clarity of your pour overs, the sweetness of your espresso, you can switch out the burrs for these. Um, otherwise, you can maintain the Eureka ones, which have those patented diamond coating, which give you a long life similar to a TIN coating or anything else. All right, so now I'm gonna brew a filter cup of coffee and we're just gonna talk about the flavor profile that this gives off in comparison with other grinders that I have. And then I'm gonna pull a shot of espresso and do the same thing. Of course, I'm not going to you know, spend another 20 minutes with other grinders pulling it all. I've had a lot of taste experience with this grinder and a lot of other grinders. Um, if you don't believe me, go through my YouTube channel. I have like a thousand grinders I've reviewed. But um, yeah, so I'm gonna use a, uh, just so you all know, this is a really lightly roasted coffee um, by um, a roaster called, uh, oh my goodness, Sun, Sun Child, I believe, out in California. It's a washed Colombian, but it's incredibly light. I'll go ahead and show you an up close of this, this coffee. So you just have an idea. Okay. So really lightly roasted coffee, just so you have an idea on how this performs with lighter coffees. All right, so I'm gonna grind this up, get the, the, the filter ready. I have the stag preheating on the kettle right now, and all right, so the brew finished at about three minutes. I did three pours, 15 in, 250 grams out, or 250 grams of water. I ground at around 1,200 microns for this brew, and so I'm gonna show you what the bed looks like. Put this in here. Okay. All right, so as you can see on that bed, there is some muddy, like, silt-like layers on top, but it's really not terrible. I've done a lot of seasoning on this grinder, so it's, it, it does a pretty good job. Granted, there are, again, when you're grinding at this, this size, or, or there is a substantial amount of fines or of smaller particles than we're intending to get, but not, not the worst I've seen, I guess. It's definitely more geared towards espresso. So now we're gonna do a little taste test of it. Now normally this coffee has some really nice like nectarine, some light uh, like refined sugar. Um, it's got uh, kind of like a, a baked peach kind of thing going on. So it's got some nice stone fruits in it. So on the nose, I'm getting a little like panella or like brown sugar. There's a little sugar browning note. Maybe, maybe, yeah, something like that. And a little hint of stone fruit. Nothing, nothing clear though, which I'm going to imagine is from, it's kind of muddled as I said. Yeah, so it's a lot, there's a lot of like black tea in here. Um, it's a little drying on the end. Um, but I can get some of that peach. There's a little bit of peach in there. Um, but it's, very, it's a very simplistic cup that somehow, even with this incredibly lightly roasted coffee, brings out a little bit of that like cocoa type of chocolate taste, um, which, which a lot of that's just from the amount of fines that it's producing. So it's kind of over extracting that, the, the fines portion, but it's not killing the cup. It's still, it's still a tasty cup. I would just definitely recommend if you're a filter lover, especially if you're doing lighter roasted coffees, to maybe make a switch of the burr set to something more um, capable of doing filters like those burrs I showed earlier. But it's got it's got some like some some like stewed fruit, but the clarity is completely gone. It's it's definitely a muddled cup that focuses more on like a, a, more on like a body, a little bit of sweetness, and some muddled fruits in it. But yeah, it's not it's not bad. Okay, it does have a really drying finish though. There's an astringent finish to it, and I didn't even go I didn't go very fine on this. I did a pretty quick brew, so um, yeah, take that for what it is. All right, now we're gonna do one for espresso. All right, so now I need to get my Umeshiso James Hoffman collaboration spoon. <laughs> there we have it. We're gonna stir this little bad boy up. Daddy Hoff would be proud. We got our nice shot of espresso. I did 19 in, 45 out in about 32 seconds. The aroma is really nice. That is baking spices, that is baked peaches. That is, I mean, that is that smells nice. So honestly smells like, um, Smells like what, um, uh, in Holes, if you've read the book Holes or, or seen the movie Holes, the, the peaches that Sam was famous for, or not Sam, the teacher was famous for, right? Sploosh is what Stanley Yelnats made it into. That's what this reminds me of, as if that was real. Anyway. It's actually pretty bright. I mean, this is a very bright coffee in general. It actually did a pretty good job on espresso. Now I've pulled this obviously with many other grinders and it's not, it's not hitting the same balance as other grinders because this one is so, it's so, it's so, it, it's kind of um, 
stuck in this area of trying to just produce as much body and sweetness as possible, which is great. But on a lot of coffees, especially ones that are more acid forward, it kind of just throws it out of whack. It throws it out of balance. So you have, um, I wish there was kind of like a way I could chart this for you visually, but you kind of had this like, this weird bright acidity that feels out of place in the cup, if that makes sense. So you have, you have this body that doesn't really work because it's a light roast, but it's, it's trying to, to give it a, this thicker body. Um, and you have a sweetness that is punching through the acidity, but it's kind of weakly punching through it because it's not able to produce enough uh, because how light it is. That being said, I've obviously used this grinder with darker roasted coffees, and those all pr perform very well in espresso, incredibly well, especially for the style you're wanting. So if, you're if you enjoy medium and darker roasts, this will do your espresso a lot of justice in my opinion, but this actually is not bad. Now, there's actually a little bit more like citric acidity as it sits and cools. Honestly, kind of like a pink lemonade as it cools there. So it starts off with these heavier, uh, darker notes, but it, it cools to something brighter. Florals aren't really present, which this is a pretty, pretty dang floral coffee, but you know, you can't really expect it from something that's more geared towards traditional. Um, but yeah, so that is kind of my, my, Overview of the, uh, the, the single dose Oro. Um, it can fit a lot of other 64 millimeter burrs if they are under 64.1 mils. Um, it will fit in here. Um, there's no real way to, to modify it. I know there are gonna be some questions if you can modify it for SSP. There's not really a way, if you saw that top burr carrier, there's not enough thickness on that rim to be able to Dremel it out or anything. Um, you'd have to like remachine a full new piece, but the holes do align on all these different burrs I showed you, so you can switch those out if you would like. Um, the retention is actually as good as is described. Um, if you're using a dark roasted coffee, I can see the shoot clogging up being an, an actual issue. So just remember that after every one, you really need to bang it. Like you gotta bang it so it doesn't build up. If you're not banging this after every one, it can build up, which is gonna happen in any uh, machine with a declumper or anything like that. It can build up and clog the chute. So just remember that after each one, I'm gonna give it a few, a few knocks. Um, make sure you get it all out of the chute and you should be good to go with this. Um, again, I really like how strong the motor is. I'm a huge fan of the Eureka mo motors. I think the build quality is nice. Um, it's pretty substantial, it's pretty heavy. Um, there are still some plasticky pieces on it, but overall, um, I'm a fan. I like, I think the bellows is actually a really nice touch. Um, and it's a really,